Hey, Bridget. Hi, Kat. What's up? I'm trying to open this stupid ranch and it's not working with me. Ranch? Yeah, like ranch dressing. I know what you mean. I know ranches. So you're having dinner? Yeah, dude, I made spaghetti and sauce and chicken and I have no idea how it's gonna be but I'm gonna try it. You're gonna take notes if you're eating. Huh? How are you gonna take notes? <laughs> With my hands <laughs> on the paper. Oh wow. I'm a fast eater. Yeah me too. I don't know why. I had my pizza earlier. Did you see my story with my amazing pizza? Yeah dude and the ama amazing envelope. Yeah, that's for doing virtual youth group with the kids yesterday. Oh, that's awesome. Yep, they got me the, she gave me the pizza and the cash, and I was like, thank you. That's very nice of them, especially now. Oh, yeah, she's the coolest. Sarah, I love working for them. That's why it's going to be my career.
That's great, dude. I have my Ferrero Rocher and Sour Airhead bites, though. Oh, dude, Ferrero Rocher. I need some. Oh, so good. I went uh, to the the food drive. They had the CC the other day. And I got a lot of I got a lot of things, which was nice, especially now because food is kind of, you know, becoming expensive when you don't work. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm waiting for my um my CalFresh. Um, I I've, I mailed them back a thing today telling them that I need um because I get CalFresh benefits, so they give me money and I it kind of covers my groceries every month. You should mm-hmm. sign up for that if you haven't. Well, can I do it even though I'm not a citizen? Um, yeah, maybe not. I don't know. You could try. A lot of people did it at C. A lot of people did it at CC. Um, and it's really cool. Like, it's like I get like enough money a month to cover all my groceries. Can you send me the link? Uh, yeah. It's just I, I'm not sure. I didn't. Uh, I did it at school. Um, oh, okay. Look it up. Just apply for CalFresh. Yeah, I'll look it up after. Yeah, it's really cool. Like it's it's pretty easy too. Like you just give them your info, and then you um, and then they call they call you and talk to you on the phone about it, and then they send you a letter or whatever. That's good. Yeah, it was really cool. Hello, Katharina. Hey, Sean. Okay, so I'm, I'm back. I'm ready to go. You guys ready to go? Yes. I got yeah. my, look at my shirt. I got my cool shirt on. Love I'm it. here at school. Nice. I'm at the geology lab because we have good internet here. Yeah, I think Zoom is way better than watching on YouTube. This way we can actually talk. Yeah, the more yeah, interactivity. I, like, I, I figured I'd try it out. You know, this is, uh, we'll try it out. I don't know if everybody's going to come anyway, so. We'll see. We'll see how many people want to interact and how many people just want to watch passively, you know. Mm-hmm. So what I'll do, though, is, um, yeah, there's a few people here. Uh, page, okay, so page 00B is the telescope page that we're going to look at. But otherwise, otherwise, we're going to take notes, right? Yes. Uh, for the lecture, we're going to take notes. I'm write a note to somebody. Um, So yeah, how's life? You guys managing? Uh, somewhat. It's strange being in the house all day, every day. I know, I know. Well, you don't have to stay in the house. You could take a walk or something. And... I know the problem is my my part of the town where I live. There's there are so many families, so many people, and everyone's going on a walk. I'm like, I can't. You know, I don't want to feel be like you you can't get out, huh? Yeah. Shoot. Well, I have to say, I don't think I would be doing very well if I had to stay in the house all the time like I've been escaping to school nobody's here so yeah it's actually pretty nice to be here but I you know I don't know what to say it's it's very difficult you got to be really strong yeah I mean I get through this I live with the older people so I don't want to risk you know yeah you don't want to expose them uh that's good you're aware well hopefully I mean things look look I I don't know what's going to happen but you know it looks like maybe there, there's some good news, right? That the number of cases is not going up as dramatically as they as they were af- afraid of, right? Yeah. Well, also the nice thing is what they didn't report is that you know globally, all of the people you know who are infected, two hundred thousand people got better. You know, they got healthier. They recovered. exactly they recovered. Yeah, recuperated. Yeah. Yeah. So that's nice. Uh, you know, nice num- number to see and know. Yeah. Well, the other thing I, I think is pretty exciting is they're talking about using the people who recovered, maybe their plasma can have antibodies, you know, so if they're, you know, they're trying to look for ways to treat people, it might be that the, the people who are getting really sick, if they can get some, some help, this is one, one strategy that might work. Well, so, you know. what I've heard from my family in Europe, uh, in Italy, they found this vaccine that worked on, you know, a couple of all older people, like over 70, and they both recovered. So they're trying to see if that vaccine is going to help even more people. So uh-huh. they're, you know, still in the testing 
phase. So if it works, they're going to just hopefully distribute, you know, the, the vaccine and it's going to help. Yeah, I hope so. Well, we'll see what happens. I got two of you guys here. So we, we may be the only three here. And then we have uh, uh, a couple of people watching on YouTube. But I'm just going to go ahead and get started at seven. And then I think the rest of the people will, you know, if they don't come, they're just going to watch the recording, which is fine. It'll work. But you guys are going to get it live. So if you have any questions, um, it'll be, uh, you know, you can ask the questions and I'll try to answer. But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to do a, can you guys, um, oh, you can see it any way you want, actually. Um, but I think what I'm going to try to do is, uh, well, I'll be sharing screen and stuff. I'll, I'll do it that way. But um, yeah, so tonight's lecture is about the telescope. And let's see, what else should we do? Should we try to... Um, Talk a little bit about, I haven't seen you guys in a while. Oh, well, Sean, I actually yeah. have a question for you. Sure, ask a question. So I've heard today that the bill of juice is going to shut down, you know, quote unquote, that it's going Explode. away. Explode? Yeah. Is well, not, not going to happen soon, it turns out. In fact, what's really fun is it's been brightening up again. And so it turns out Beetlejuice has been dim. Actually, maybe we can talk about it. You wanna you wanna talk about it a little bit? Let me uh, yeah, let me show you guys something. A presentation about you know planets and uh -huh. stars, and they were comparing them by size, which was very mm -hmm. interesting. you know like when you put them one next you know other, you actually see what the difference is between Earth right. and Saturn or Earth and Jupiter. So you know mm -hmm. that was interesting, and they kind of stayed on Beetlejuice and said, yeah, this you know. Bill just is kind of gonna go kablamo and it's not gonna happen. <laughs> not not for a while though it turns out yeah so one of um one of the adjuncts an adjunct who's teaching on wednesday night class actually his specialty is giant stars that explode uh -huh. and that's what he's getting his phd in actually so he oh. he was telling me um that all of his simulations don't don't show anything like this they show that the star will get brighter just before it explodes not get dimmer and so one of the, you know, the kind of the way that we feel a little more positive is that this has happened before, right? Beetlejuice has actually gotten dimmer before, just not this dim. So this is kind of exceptional, but it's going back up again. Hey, Jose, how are you doing? Welcome. Glad you could be here. So, um, you know, Beetlejuice is actually a good story. So why don't we start with that? Actually, it's kind of a fun thing. I'm going to encourage you guys to use this program called Stellarium. And uh, I'm getting better at using this program Zoom here, but I, I know what I need to do. I, I screwed a couple of things up this morning. I was giving a lecture and I, I, I was showing them something, but I, I actually um, accidentally. Jackie, tell me more. What was that? Oh no, where did Kat go? <laughs> we what lost. Was that? We lost Kat. Oh, where'd she go? Oh, she'll be back. She'll be back. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead. Right. I'm going to go to Stellarium. Now you guys can see my Stellarium, right? Yeah. Yeah. I okay. just actually I installed it already. Awesome. Okay. So it's a pretty neat program, and this this version is a little more powerful than the Stellarium Web. Even though Stellarium Web is actually pretty neat, I I think this is actually better. Can you guys still see it? Can you see it, Bridget? Yeah, I can see. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to use you. You're, you're kind of my guinea pig here. So if you don't see something, let me know. Uh, okay. There's the moon. There's the moon. I see the moon. Uh, the moon is super bright. Actually, we can even look uh, where it is in its phase. It's 68% illuminated. Can you guys see that? 68%. So you can zoom in. It's actually pretty fun. You can zoom in and see exactly what it, what it looks like. Mm. So all, what, all I'm what seeing is, is the it? sky and the grass. There's no numbers or anything. I mean, there's the direct. I'm not seeing any grid or percents or anything. Oh, uh, over here on the left hand side. Yeah, there's nothing there. It's just grass. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, well, wait a second. Wait a second. Do you see anything now? Do you see the moon zoomed in? No. Oh, just wait a minute. So there's a little lag. Oh, you don't see the moon? No, I don't see the moon. Uh-oh, so that's not working then. So you can't see the moon? No. Can you see the, the view changing at all? No, it's still the same. Oh, OK. Mouse so moving this, around, this, but it, huh? You can see your mouse moving around, but nothing else. 
but nothing else. Oh, yeah, that's like didn't the work. still screen. Yeah. Okay, that's a fail. Okay. Okay. Maybe well, the website so I just discovered work? something. No, hold on, hold on. We'll just do the we'll, we'll do the web then. Um. So what happens is the program is not allowing it to be captured. That's okay. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> that's pretty funny though. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. So hopefully this will be better. Let's try this. Thank you for for testing that with me. Hold on. No let's problem. try this. Also, hi Daniel. So now now we have Stellarium Web. Okay. Oh yeah. Now that's better. Yeah, you can see stuff, and I'm moving it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And actually, it's kind of cool. There's a little search here, you know, but except I can see it right here. So there's Venus, right? Oh, and right now I, I actually clicked the, the wrong thing. Uh, I clicked the Pleiades by accident. So look at how close the Pleiades is to Venus tonight. Oh, that's cool. That crazy. It's right next to it. So if you go out tonight, that would be kind of a fun thing to look for. Uh, so Venus is right there. So this program, um, the web version is not quite as powerful. Um, there is, you know, you can do a lot of the things, but it's, um, it's just not as good as the program. But anyways, um, here is here are the constellations uh, outlines, right? So you can see Venus is in, in uh, the constellation of Taurus right now. Um, but actually down here in the corner, I can click this and I can actually just change the date to tomorrow. Oh, and you can see something very interesting. Look at how Venus is moving, right? Day after day, Venus is just moving just a little tiny bit. Now, can you tell, is it moving towards the east or towards the west? What do you think? Um, it's going east, right? That's right, towards the east, right? So um, uh, it's actually going away from, it's going away from west. So that's how I know that it's going east. So interestingly enough, oh, wait a second, wait a second. Something just happened. Look what happened. It stopped moving and it's fading away. So something's going to happen over the next month or so, maybe month and a half, and Venus will continue to progress. But you'll notice, look at what's happening to the size of it in this program. Well, what's happening? Bigger. It's well, I, I'm going back in time. Oh, also oh, shrinking. So, so it goes let's forward. see. If you watch, it got it's getting bigger and bolder and brighter right now, and then watch what happens as it progresses. What's happening? Oh, it's getting really small. And why anyway. does that happen? Well, in this program, the size Zika. of it re reflects the the uh, retrograde. The mat. Well, no, no, the magnitude of the of the object. So, if it's bigger, it is a brighter object. And if it's brighter, what can you say about the magnitude? A higher or lower number? Lower. Lower, right? Lower number. Good, good, good. So that's one of the things you guys are supposed to be doing is looking at the stars and trying to measure. Uh, or estimate the magnitudes of the stars. So over here we have Betelgeuse. Now Betelgeuse um, actually has another name and it's right here, it's kind of small. I wonder if I can zoom in on that. Can you guys see that? Yeah, there you go. Can you see the letter in front? It's the letter Alpha. So Alpha Orionis, right? Alpha, it's the Alpha star. Now it's supposed to be the brightest star um, and I wonder if this is accurate because right now it says the magnitude is 0.5. But if I click on Rigel, right now it says 0.19. Which one's brighter? Rigel, right? Yeah, 0.19 is lower than 0.5. So this thing is probably pretty accurate right now. Um, and this one, Rigel, is the beta star. You see the beta symbol? That's the B. So it should be the second brightest star in the constellation. But right now they're reversed, right? So they're they're actually uh, a little bit out of order. But Betelgeuse is on its way back up, and so that's kind of a fun thing. So, um, anyways, it's a fun little program. So one of the things you can do is start uh, practicing your constellations here, or not start, but practice constellation. And uh, let's see, here are some some of the constellations we recognize: Orion, and up here Gemini. I should turn off the lines, huh? Uh, see if you can see it. So here is a backwards question mark. Can you see the backwards question mark? Yeah. Okay, and that would be Leo the what? Leo the what? Lion. lion. Leo the lion, very good. And then there's a star right here, I can actually click it, called Alphard. That's a kind of a neat thing though, right? We can, we can click on these stars. 
So remember, the bigger the star, the higher the the uh, the brighter it is, and the lower the number will be. So I see I see a bright star here, here, here. This one's not quite as bright. Here, Sirius, of course, is the brightest star, because this is negative one point oh nine. I think it's a little bit lower than that even, but uh, maybe not. I don't know. That's pretty funny. It's supposed to be negative one point five. Okay. What would this star right here be, which is also very bright? Right next to Sirius. I'll give you a hint, right? It's actually a constellation right there. What is it? Okay, oh, you don't it's recognize it's Canis Canis Minor. Minor. Yeah, it's Canis Minor. Canis Minor, very good. And here's a pair of twin stars. What's this one right here? Flex. This one that I'm hovering over right now, what would it be? It's this is Procyon. This must be... Pollux. Pollux. And then what about the one right next to it? Castor. Castor, Castor right? And then over here, the bright star. Capella, right? Capella, right? Capella. Yes. And I'm, oh no, of course. Okay, Capella. How about this bright star right here? See the V shape? Oh, it's um, Aldebaran. Aldebaran, very good. So you can practice, right? This one right here, look at, this is Orion, so. Yeah. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. Bellatrix. 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 Rigel, Rigel. and Theia. Right, very good. Uh, as you go across right here, uh, we'll go ahead and turn on the lines for a second, right? If you go over here to Leo, what's the star at the bottom of the backwards question mark? Do you remember the name? Oh. Is the Royal Regal Lion. Regulus. 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 Very good. Regulus. And the tail star. Anybody remember that one? De Nebula. De Nebula. Very good. Okay. And now let's look at our big dipper here because we're going to use it. Here's the dipper. This is Doobie, right? There's Doobie. Um, but anyways, you choose the handle right here and you arc to this bright star. What's the name of the bright star? Arcturus. Arcturus, right? And then you spike sideways to this bright star. Spica? Spica, very good. Okay, so those are all the stars. Uh, do you see this one right here? It doesn't show you a name. Can anybody remember the name of this uh, constellation? Um, it's, it looks like a goblet. It's Crater. Crater the? Cup. The cup. And now when I zoom in, you can see it, right? Uh, ah. What was this one right here with just one, two, three, four yeah. stars, right? Uh, is it that one's Corvus? Corvus the crow. The crow, right? Here's the crow, and here's Crater the Cup. And then this big long snake right here, where uh, is called Hydra, the water snake, right? Virgo the maiden. What was this one right here? Buotis the what was herdsman. It? The herdsman, and what's the nickname because of the shape? The ice cream cone. The ice cream cone, right? The ice cream cone. So those are, that's pretty good. Oh, we left out one. Actually, right next to the moon tonight, there is a really cool little cluster. So they put Presepes M44. Who knows the name M44? What is that? It has so a special name. Beehive cluster? That's right, the beehive. There's the beehive, and there's these little buzzy bees around it. So you can actually zoom in and see, um, see stuff. So do you think you can see it tonight with the moon? The moon, no. bright, the moon right? will bright, right? Blind you. Yeah. You will not be able to see it right next to the moon tonight. Anyways, this is a pretty fun little yeah. program. We're going to talk about your homework, uh, not homework, but your lab work in a few minutes. And we're going to be using this, um, even though I want you to use Stellarium, I'll try to make this thing work. Um, so let's go back to uh, let's go back to this for a second. Just make sure we know what we're doing here. So um, you have to turn in page 12A. Right. And actually, I um, I just changed this. So if you didn't, you didn't do this, right? You didn't have a way to upload it. But right now it says submit assignment. I want you to put your pictures for the for the pages that you did so that I can grade them. OK, so you have until next week. So don't worry if you haven't done it. But if you if you didn't already watch uh, last uh, lecture before the break, the 19th, we went over exactly how to do this. So you can go look at that again if you want a little review. Uh, but it has to do with the star magnitude, right? So we don't have to be very careful. Please don't cheat because there's no value there. There's none at all. 
So just don't cheat. Okay, one thing that's missing is your um, your participation. And I have to actually make a quiz. I haven't made it yet. So unfortunately, I spent all this time getting ready for your uh, your lecture tonight. And and so I didn't actually make it. But um, I will I will tell you that um, I will have it up. I probably will not be tonight. It'll be tomorrow. And then you have you have a couple of days to do it. I'll give you till Sunday. Okay, so um, if you look under um, PowerPoints for the class, I have a new slide. So if you already downloaded the old PowerPoint, please grab the new version right here. And I'm gonna be using that tonight uh, as I go through the lecture. Um, yeah, what is this? What was that? Oh, that was, I don't know what that is. Stellar magnitude. Oh, that was the... That's a slide set I used last time. Okay, that's a new one, right? You guys, I'm doing all this new stuff for you. I'm very happy about that, actually. I that's think very it's exciting. Stuff. Yeah, yeah it's good you. stuff. You're welcome, my pleasure. Okay, so we are gonna go ahead and get started then. So what I want you to do is, um, let's just see who's here. Let's see who's here right now. We got Daniel, all right, Daniel. How's it going, bud? Good, good. Can you guys see, you can't see my face yet. Let me see, let me say hi. Hey, man. Hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> we got a couple of people on Zoom. Let's see who's on the other one, the YouTube. And we got, oh, not too many. We got, we got Irvin. Irvin, you're here. Good, good, good. Everybody else is going to watch the recording, I guess. Uh, that's fine. You guys are here. I'm here. We're going to have fun. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do now is show you guys a little lecture on telescopes. So you want to take, you're in a hospital, dude. What's going I'm on? In the, I'm in the Airstream. Oh, you're in Airstream. Oh my God, I, I thought it was a hospital. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. You have an Airstream? Yeah. That's nice, how fun. Okay, so everybody, so, um, um, if, you, if you get out your lab manual, we're gonna go ahead and take some notes in the back, right? Um, so just grab a page somewhere in the back. I don't know, you guys have blank paper. You could use blank paper, or use line paper, whatever. And then just call it the telescope lecture. And we're going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to show you um, a bunch of slides and we'll talk about telescope. I've made a bunch of changes to it. So I'm actually very excited to try them. You guys are my first class to, to get to try all these things. But, um, but I've enhanced it. It's much better than it used to be. It's not quite as ugly anymore either. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of excited. So let's try this out. So we are going to look at a slide set as PowerPoint, and you can download it yourself. Okay. Can you guys see your pictures on the side? Yeah, it depends okay. on how you arrange them on your computer. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can, you can minimize them. It's your choice. Okay, how about, how about that? Can you see them now or, or just the telescope slides? Uh, we can see the pictures on the telescope. It's up to the individual person. They shut them off. Oh, okay, okay, cool. So... You know, make it big enough so you can see it. And the lecture tonight is about telescopes. Oh, I know what I forgot to do. Can you guys hear me okay? Is the volume, is the sound okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Is the sound good or not good? That's no, good. Because I have a mic, actually. I forgot to hook up. Should I use the mic? No, I think this is enough. Are you sure? Okay. Yeah. So I don't need the mic? Okay, no. I'm actually right on the computer. So that's, this is closer than I usually am. Okay, so how do they work? Here we go. So we're gonna do a, a little lecture on telescopes. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about history just for a moment. It's not really something that I'm gonna test you on, but you know, the idea is just to share a little bit about it. Um, who invented the telescope? Anybody know? A lot of times people think it was Galileo, but it turns out it wasn't Galileo. He was just merely, uh, merely, it's kind of important. He was the first person to use it for astronomy. So um, anyways, that's no big deal. Here we go. The guy who invented it was a Hollander, a Netherlander named Hans Lippershe. And you don't, again, you don't have to know that, but 1608. And Galileo was one of the first people to, uh, to take his idea and make his own version of it. And he was, in fact, the first person to use it for astronomy. So Lippershey, you know, invent, invented it really for spying on people and, and looking at um, things that are far away. Maybe a, a ship captain would have one or a general would have one. It was a military use mainly, or, or maybe for the sea. And Galileo turned it to the heavens and started looking up and seeing all these amazing things. Um, so 
His design was so successful that he manufactured telescopes and actually made a significant amount of money selling them to other people. But they were pretty simple, very, very simple devices. Uh, a little bit later, we have Johannes Kepler. You guys remember him, maybe? He was the fellow who figured out that the planets travel on elliptical orbits. Same guy. Uh, he figured out an optical system that uses mirrors, right? So this is a pretty, uh, I'm sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong. He used a system that made, um, uh, made a better image. Sorry, that was a better image. He made a better image, still with lenses. Sorry, still with lenses. It was Newton who came up with uh, the mirrors. Okay, so lenses, how do they work? What's the basic idea? And so a lens is a piece of material, could be a piece of glass or plastic or or even, you know, your eye is a kind of lens. In fact, that actually is the coolest thing I found when I was looking around today, the neatest little simulation uh, that shows how your eye works. Um, so I actually want you to, to try to look at this right here. This is a the very typical lens. It's called a convex lens. And we have rays of light that are coming in like laser beams. And what do you notice? They all come together at a point. And this is something that's happening inside of your eye. So actually, this is worth it. Let's just go to the sim and take a look right here. This is the neatest thing. Oh my gosh. So this is a model of an eye. Oh my God, I love this. This is the coolest thing ever. I've never done this with any group of students before and I wish I would have. They even have an overlay to show you how the eye works. Is this cool? You didn't, uh, we can't see the eye. Um, I, can you see the eye? No, you have to no. switch um, the screens from the lens one to the eye sim page. Oh my gosh, I did it again. Oops, I did it again. Okay. <laughs> you guys see what, I, see what I did there? Yeah, that song just turned 20, Wild Time. No way. <gasps> yeah. Oh my God. Okay, thank you. Thank you for telling me to do that. Okay, now do you see it? Yes. Okay, now watch this. Ooh. Is that awesome? Oh yeah. Can you guys see an, can you see an eye now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's go back to the just the basic idea. And the front of your eye is a lens. So this is the piece that, that the light is going to come through and the retina is on the back of your eye. That's how you see. So if you have normal vision and an object is far away, your muscles will change the shape of the lens and allow you to focus on it. Right? And so the focus, take a look right here. What happens to the rays of light? They come together at the back of the eye. They're in focus now, right? If, you're, if your object is very close to your eye, can you see that the rays are not focused? And so your muscles have to relax actually. And when they do, you change the shape of the lens and you can make them focus on the back of your eye again. So someone with normal vision has the ability to do this. It's called accommodation, right? And not all of us, it's not just the muscles, it turns out the shape of your eye might be a little bit, you know, a little bit off in one direction or another. So you have to wear glasses. So if you're nearsighted, take a look right here, what that means. You're nearsighted, what does it mean? An object is close, your muscles can do this, right? They can actually get it to be focused. You can see objects that are close to you. But if you try to move the object far away, something happens, your muscles can't accommodate and they never make a point, right? They never get to this point right here. Does that make sense? And yeah. so you need to fix it by putting on glasses or contacts and boom, now we fixed it. See, now we have a way of changing the focus point and getting it so that it is in the right location back at the retina. That's what glasses are doing, right? Contact lenses are doing. If you're farsighted, it's a little bit different. Uh, when you're farsighted, um, you can focus just fine on an object that is far from you. But if you bring it too close to your eye, too close to you, your eye just can't do it, right? And so you need to correct for that. So I didn't make it as sexy. You can correct for that with a lens, and now you can get it focused again. Isn't that awesome? This is the yeah. coolest thing. I love this. Oh, my God. I have so many cool things to show you tonight. Okay, so that is a, um, that's just a little sh description. But what you see is the eye is a lens, right? The eye is a kind of a lens. And so it takes the light and tries to bring it to a point. Okay, so I'm gonna, can I just switch share? Oh yeah, new share, that's it. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna be a pro by the time we're done. 
Yeah. Oh, I got it. Now, do you see a slide again? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so um, this is called the focal point. Maybe you should write that down. Oh, actually, I have a slide coming up that'll show you that. Okay. So actually, right, right here, there are two kinds of lenses, and I mentioned them a, a few minutes ago uh, uh, that that Kepler uh, actually came up with a combination telescope that used both kinds. You don't have to know too much about this, but I just want to share it. It's something that you can understand. There are two basic kinds of lenses. One is called a convex lens. This is a more typical lens. This is what your eye is doing. This is what a magnifying glass is doing, right? This is, this is a more typical, this is what most telescope lenses begin with, right? And so the rays of light come in, and they converge, which means go to a single point. So the disc, so you should draw a picture just like this in your notes, right? Draw a picture. And because you need to know something important, right? The fact is, number one, it comes to a point, right? And number two, it's a certain distance. There's a certain distance required to make it come to a point. And this is called the focal length. Okay, so you want to put that in your notes. So in a convex lens, we say that it is a converging lens because the light comes together. There is another kind of lens down here, which kind of does the opposite. Instead of bringing light together, it spreads it apart. And you might be like, why do I want that? But it turns out that's the trick. Uh, you know, for some people, that's the trick to fix their vision, right? Or with telescopes even, that's the trick to fix the vision of the telescope. But the idea with the concave lens, it's a diverging lens because the rays of light come in and then they go away from, oops, sorry. They go away from a common point, this common point right here. They see how this imagine these rays all seem to come from this place. They don't actually come from this point. They just move away from this point. It's like they're repelled by this point or something. Okay, do y'all see that in the diagram? Yeah. Okay. So there's still a focal length though, right? There's a distance and actually in this case, it's from the, the lens to where this point is, okay? Again, we're not doing a lot of equations. We're not doing math. If you wanna study this, the field is called optics and it's a part of physics. So, you know, there, it's available to you if you're interested, okay? All right, so let's go right along. Why can't you see an object that is far away? Well, the problem is that an, an object doesn't take up enough space on your eye uh, if it's really far away, right? Imagine you were uh, you know, trying to take a picture of a dime, right? That was 50 meters away, halfway down a football field, right? Could you read the writing on the dime? And the answer is no way, right? It's just too far away, it's too small. But it turns out the trick uh, to solving this problem is to use a telescope, right? You could use a telescope and you could see the writing on a dime at 50 meters away. That's something that you could do. And what it does basically is it uses a, uh, a property of light that when light passes through from one medium into another, from one material into another, it refracts or bends. So you should write that word down, refract, refraction. And I'm gonna take you to another simulator, which I really, really like. This is uh, PHET, I'm gonna go there right now. So probably I have to switch again. So I'm gonna click the link and then I'm gonna go ahead and uh, new share. And boy, I'm like a pro, check that out. Went right to the Ooh. thing, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, so take a look right here. We got our introduction. Ooh. We have got a laser beam. This is a laser, okay? This is so fun. Now you'll nice. notice that this is, this is like air up here in the white and down here is probably like water, but there's a little slider over here um, that you can play with. And I encourage you, if you wanna learn a little bit, just have fun, uh, play with it a little bit. Look what happens, right? I go to glass or even go past that. Or if I go back, I go back, 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 back. And if I turn it into air, what happens? What do you notice when it goes from air to air? What happens to the laser beam? Nothing. Nothing at all, because there's no boundary, right? There has to be a boundary for something to happen. There has to be a change. So as soon as you do, well, look what happens, right? by the way. So what happened to the light? 
when it went from one material to another? Did it go straight or did it change direction? It bends. It bends, right? So you can actually, we're not doing this. This is not what I'm doing, but I'm doing it. Oh my God, I love this. I want to just do this, but you guys, you really don't need to do this, right? So right now, I would say the angle is 60 degrees, right? But look at this down here. It's only what? Like 40 degrees, right? So it's definitely not the same angle. Uh, we measure it in a certain way. You don't have to know that. I don't want to tell you all of that stuff. So this is refraction. This is, and so this number here, you again, don't need to know this at all. It's called the index. It tells you how much it's going to be bent. Now, do you notice something here? What's going on? Part of the laser beam is being bounced. What is bouncing called? Reflecting. Reflection. Reflecting. So if you notice yeah. something kind of interesting, part of the ray, uh, part of the light is always going to bounce. And what do you notice about the angle that it bounces? Um, do you see the angle? Uh, that you see? It's, it's complementary. Well, it's actually the same, but it's bouncing over on this other side. Yeah. So we say that the angle we measure from the middle. And so this angle is the same as this angle, right? So it kind of, or you could, you could measure this angle here, right here. And this angle would be the same 30 and 30, right? So when light bounces, it makes the same angle on both sides. Again, we're not going to study any of this. I just wanted to show you. It's kind of a fun thing, right? So however you change it, that's what it does, right? Now there's actually, um, oh, so this is, again, you can change this top material too. And if it goes to water, then nothing happens. There's no boundary. Okay. Uh, so our second one, kind of more fun, we have uh, prisms. We have little, you know, blocks of glass or, or what, you could change it, right? To something else, water, glass, whatever. And I have this laser and I can shoot it through here. And look what happens, it bends, right? It bends when it comes to the first, oops, hold on, I missed. Okay, bends, let's see if I can really bend it. See how it bent when it came to the first? Oh, and then it doesn't look like it bent. That's actually a little secret. Again, you're not supposed to know that. So why am I telling you? I don't know, just for fun. If you, if you make a laser go straight uh, into an, a piece of glass, at a 90 degree angle right here, then it goes straight through. It actually doesn't get bent. The rays that get bent are the ones that are at some kind of an angle. Okay, so that's kind of a crazy thing right here. So it's all kinds of crazy things you can do. Anyways, you see it bending, bouncing and bending again, right? This is kind of cool. Uh, also, this one lets you change the color of the laser beam. Isn't that fun? Isn't that Ooh. awesome? And you're like, why do I care, Sean? <laughs> You're gonna see in just a minute why you care. This is the coolest thing ever. There's a whole bunch of beams, right? Isn't that fun? God, I just yeah, wanna... that's really cool. I know you just play with this stuff. Okay, so that's cool. That's cool. Anybody like Pink Floyd? Yes. Pink did Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. Yesterday, actually. You were what? I did a whole class on Pink Floyd yesterday. No way! That's crazy. Yeah. Recognize. And we studied how um, Dark Side of the Moon lines up with the Wizard of Oz story. The whole album is based oh, on Oh, I that. heard about that. That's crazy. Okay, it's cool. so wild. You can watch the movie on YouTube lined up with the, with the whole album, with the song. With the wall or what? which one? The wildest thing. Oh, the wildest things. And it matches, huh? That yeah, all so the crazy. songs line up with different scenes. That's crazy. Okay, so what is this called when the light bends, when it goes from one material to another? refraction refraction everybody got the word right now i want to i don't want to i don't want to tune you guys in too soon but now we're going to put on white light refract okay uh, refraction is what happens when it bends and i want to show you this really cool thing right here look what happens do you see it the Rainbow. light is bending but look at what happens when it comes out the other side does the do the different colors bend the same amount what do you see mm -hmm. You see how they're spreading? Yeah. yeah. The reason they're spreading is because different colors bend different <laughs> amounts. Which color bends oh, the weird. most and which one bends the least? Red and blue. Yeah. So red and this is actually violet. You can't see it. Violet. So well, yeah. I'll show you another version of it that's even clearer and you'll be able to see it. So the, the <laughs> red bends the least and the violet bends the most. So I actually discovered something freaking cool. This is so 
over the top unneeded for your class, but it's so awesome is there, he actually shows how rainbows are made and it's so freaking cool. So here's a single drop of water hanging up in the air, right? And this is white light coming in and he's showing you red and violet, right? And actually he's gonna show you all the colors of the rainbow here, right? So can you see which one's been the most? Yeah. The violet bends the most and the red bends the least, right? So mm -hmm. let me just show you, let me zoom out now. So you're down here on the ground. When you look up in the sky, which color will appear to be higher in the sky? And by the way, there's not just a single drop, there's all kinds of drops coming from all over the place. But you have to look at a higher angle to see red and a lower angle to see violet which means when you look at pictures of rainbows, which color will be on top? The red. Right, so real real life rainbows. This is real, oh, okay. That, <laughs> actually, I saw a double rainbow the other day. It was so awesome. So you see how the red is on top and yeah. the violet's on the bottom, okay? And the reason is, which color bends more? Violet. Violet bends more. That's the reason why rainbows are um, are red on top. Okay, they're red oh. on the top. It's hard to see it like this because it looks to me like red's on the bottom. But you have yeah. to imagine you're looking from down here. The red is at a steeper angle. The violet is at a smaller angle. If I see the red coming from this drop here, then I actually have to see the violet coming from another drop below it in order to get to me right here. So that's okay. Now, anyways, um, have you guys, you've heard about the second rainbow, right? The secondary rainbow? That happens when there's a second bounce. And so it turns out um, that one is the opposite. It's upside down. And so you get one version where the, the red is on top and the secondary rainbow, which is much weaker. Forget that. We see how the weaker one the violet is on top. It comes because it bounces, uh, bounces a second time. You really don't need to know anything that I'm doing right now. It's way too much. And so just because I want to do it, though, it's so freaking cool. Look at this, a 3D rainbow. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? Look at this. This is awesome. Have you ever seen a circular rainbow before? No. Yeah. Isn't that cool? You have to be kind of in the right position, maybe flying in a plane or something or on a ladder no. somewhere. <laughs> no, there was a, it was around the sun. Uh huh. There, it was uh, ice crystals in the upper uh, atmosphere. Oh, okay. And it formed a rainbow around the sun. That's crazy. Okay. So, what you want to understand though is the rainbow is a three dimensional effect and it has to do with the angle of the sunlight coming in and the droplets. And if you're in the right position, you can see it as a full circle, which is kind of cool. It's kind of rare and difficult to see. Although it turns out if you get a big ladder and you spray a hose in on a summer day, you can get the effect. I know because I used to do that to my brothers. I'd spray them and I'd be like, oh, check that out, circular rainbow. And they wouldn't be mad at me, even though they got all wet. So anyways, all right. So I am just blown away by this website. It's so freaking cool. So I hope you guys will go play with that and check that out a little bit. Um, so let's let's go back to our slides, our boring little slides here. And uh, yeah, anyway, so refraction is bending, and I showed you a little bit of an effect of that, okay, which has to do with um, uh, if the different colors don't bend exactly the same amount, that has a name. And actually, I do want to tell you that name. What does it mean? Sorry, let me just skip here for a second. Let me stop for a second. What is it called? Oh, I can see you now. Okay, um, what is it called when the different colors bend different amounts, right? So you want to write down the name for this. So different colors uh, refract different amounts, right? And which one uh, refracts most, right? Violet yes. refracts the most, right? And red, the least. Oops, least. So what does this mean? 
it turns out that in, in, a, in certain uh, telescopes, when you try to focus the light, you can't focus all of the colors because they don't bend the same amount. Does that make sense? You can only focus one color at a time. And this has a name, right? It's called chromatic aberration. How do you spell aberration? ABB, I think. I don't know. I could be wrong on that. Chromatic aberration, right? You, can, you can't focus all the colors. So you begin to see a kind of a rainbow effect because the colors are spreading uh, because they're bent different amounts by the optics. So this happens um, with lenses, right? When you use lenses, when you use a refracting telescope, this will happen. The larger the lens, the more you begin to see this. So Isaac Newton saw this problem and he's like, I can't stand that. I gotta, ch I gotta do something about it. And he figured out a really cool trick. You know what his trick was? Isaac Newton's trick. Instead of using lenses, what did he use? Oh. He used a mirror. Ta-da. Yeah. So anyway, oh. we'll talk about he, he made the first reflecting uh, telescope. OK, so um, in a telescope, we've got two basic parts that are going to do everything for us. And so you want to write down these names. The first one is called the objective lens, and that is a refracting telescope. Or the primary mirror, like we had in our telescope, a reflecting telescope. The, the first part is either the objective lens in this kind of a telescope or a primary mirror in this kind of a telescope. And then the other thing is the eyepiece. The eyepiece is either a single lens or a, pair, a couple of lenses, maybe even three uh, put together. Okay, So that's all you need. A telescope is a pretty simple thing, pretty simple device. And its goal is to, to make the, the image larger so that you can see more, right? You, it'll, pay, it'll make a bigger picture on your eye that will let you see more detail than you did before, okay? So how do you do this? Okay, so what is the objective? Blah, 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 blah. I don't think I need this. Let's skip this. I just, more words. I, I don't know. I just wrote, I got all excited about writing and you could read the slides. It's the same stuff I just said. That's it. Okay, so actually, again, repeat, except maybe one thing, right? What is the job of the objective lens or the primary mirror? What is the job? And the answer is to collect light, right? So the first thing is going to be the thing that lets the light in or collects the light. And then the eyepiece is going to be the thing that makes the image, okay? So the, the objective lens or the primary mirror is the light collector, right? And then the eyepiece is the thing that actually makes it into a picture, okay? So I'm gonna go into more detail right now. That's just, I, I feel like I repeated myself three times, but uh, hopefully by the third time you guys get it. And also let me know if you can't hear me or something, okay? Um, so right now, this is the simplest refract, oh, actually I should have asked you, what kind of a telescope is this? A refracting. <laughs> a refracting. Can you see why? Right? The rays of light are bending as they pass through the material. So this is a diagram of a simple telescope. Parallel rays enter from the right over here, pass through the objective lens, come to a focus, and then exit through the eyepiece lens. The focal length of the objective is capital F. It doesn't have to be capital. It's just a certain letter, right? you see that the focal lengths are not the same, right? These focal lengths are not the same. It's kind of like the way that a, an eye works, right? When you change with your muscles, uh, the, the curvature of your eye, then you change the distance that the light takes to focus, the focal length, okay? And then we have over here a small focal length. I would draw this picture because it's a very simple picture and we're gonna use it in a few minutes to do some calculations, right? And again, very, very simple calculations, nothing hard, okay? Nothing very difficult. All right, so we got two different focal lengths, one, one for the objective and the one for the eyepiece, all right. So that's kind of the same thing I just told you over and over again. Now I've said it one more time. 
there are two properties that you have to worry about collecting the light and then magnifying the image. Okay. So the size of the objective is essentially the size of the opening. And you should write this word down because we use it. It's called the aperture. It's the opening at the end of the telescope that lets light in. And the size of the opening is always incredibly close to the size of your objective lens or your primary mirror. It's always going to be very close to that. Okay. All right. And then this magnification is going to come from something else. Okay. So here's, here's a formula finally. The aperture or the, the uh, telescope's ability to collect light is directly related to the size of the lens or mirror. The aperture, the opening that is, that is going to allow the light to come in. The area of a circle is pi r squared. You can write that down if you want. You don't really have to know too much. We're not going to do any real calculations, but I'm going to ask you how much better is one telescope than another. And this formula is going to help you understand how that works, right? So if I make a telescope twice as big, right, then what will happen to the area? Does anybody know what will happen to the area if you make it twice as big? What will happen to the area? Anybody want to try to help me with that? If you double the radius, you get twice the area. How about that? What do you think? And it's like 10 times. <laughs> no. Okay. Let's. All right. Here we go. <laughs> I'm horrible at math. You're horrible at math. Okay. Then I'm here to help you. Okay. Here we go. So write down a formula. A equals pi r squared. Okay. Now we're not going to put any numbers in. We're just going to try to see what happens if I change the radius, right? Suppose I double the radius. That means you multiply by two. What happens to the area? You have to be able to do this because this is the kind of question you're going to get, right? What happens when you double the radius? Well, you have to square that. What happens to the number two when you square it? What do you get? You get four, right? You get four R squared. You could rearrange that. You get four in front pi r squared. What does it mean? Well, the original was pi r squared, and now I get four times as much, right? When you double the radius, the area becomes four times as much. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, so what if you make the radius 10 times as big? That's what you're trying to say, Daniel, right? Because yeah. 10 times squared becomes what? A hundred. A hundred times as much area. Okay, so now we got to try another one. What if you made the radius five times as large? 25 times. There you go. Okay, here's a real life situation. We are using five inch diameter telescopes. Okay, five inch. But the telescope that we have in the dome is 20 inches. How much bigger is it? What factor times five equals 20? Four. Four times as big. So that mirror that's collecting the light is four times as big. How much more light does it get? Um, 16 times. There you go. That's what you need to know. So Yay, if it's four times as large, it. you get 16 times as much light. So making it bigger has a pretty big impact on how much light you get, which is part of the reason why you want to use a bigger telescope, right? A bigger telescope collects more light. Okay, so the next thing is magnification. And this is like one of our only formulas that you have to even bother trying. And, and even then, I'm not going to even put numbers in really, but I showed you a sample calculation. But the telescope's magnification, its ability to enlarge an image, depends on the combination of the lenses, right? The, this was capital F in that previous diagram. And on the bottom, I have the focal length of the objective on the top and the focal length of the eyepiece on the bottom. Please write that formula down. And you don't actually need to use it very much, but you need to understand how it works, right? So 
Um, I even did a calculation in our Celestrons, the focal length of the mirror is 1250 millimeters. And if you remember, which eyepiece do we start by using? We always start by using the 25 millimeter eyepiece, right? Yeah. And if you divide those two numbers, you get 50. So it's a magnification of 50X, right? 50X, we sometimes put, it makes it 50 times as large, 50 times as large, okay? So this is the kind of question that you're gonna get. What would happen if I used a smaller number eyepiece focal length, right? Instead of a, a, 50, a 25, maybe I use the 18 or the 12 and a half. What will happen to your magnification? It will get bigger, bigger, right? It'll get bigger. You're dividing by a smaller number. So your magnification goes up, okay? That's it. That's all you really need to know. Now, do you change this very often when you're using a telescope? The top number is the focal length of the objective or the mirror, the primary mirror. Do you change your primary mirror occasionally? No. You um, never do. You only change the eyepiece. So how do you change magnification? By changing the eyepiece. How do you make the eyepiece, how do you make the magnification high? What do you use? Smaller eyepiece. A smaller focal length eyepiece. How do you make the magnification small? Bigger eyepiece. Use the bigger number for the magnification. Why do you think we start with 25 every time? Is it the highest or lowest magnification? Mm. The lowest? That's the lowest magnification. We want to start by using the lowest magnification. Okay. All right. So if you have never noticed, did you ever notice? I'm sure you did. The finder scope does this too. When you look through the eyepiece, what happens to the image? It's upside down, right? That's kind of cute. And blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're actually, I'm gonna skip this slide. It's cool that I'm gonna skip it. But remember the word, the word field of view? Remember that word? Yeah. yeah. Actually, you know what? Let me do something with you guys. I have a new thing that I just discovered. I've never used this before. And it doesn't even work anymore, it turns out, um, except that I, I did a little hack on my computer so I could use it. But it's, um, it's a virtual telescope app. Okay, so this is a virtual telescope app. Okay, so I've never used this before with students, but here we go. You guys are my guinea pigs. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Here it goes. Okay, so can you guys see a, a bunch of numbers up here and a slider? And can you see a picture of the moon? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So here's my focus knob right here. And does it look clear or blurry? Blurry. Blurry. Blurry, right? So you have to focus it. And I'm turning a knob, right? right? Trying to get it nice and sharp. Okay, so I got it, I got it in focus pretty much. So what I want to do is play around with the eyepiece. I want you to predict for me what will happen when I switch to this eyepiece here. What will happen to the size of the moon in my image? Bigger? Okay, can you tell me how much bigger? How is 20 compared to 40? It's twice as big. It'll be twice as big. It's half as, as big. So the, the image will be twice as big. You're right. Look at that. Take a look. Does that make sense? It got bigger, right? And now it's not quite focused. Like, yeah, yeah it's, it's about double the size. What's going to happen if I make it 10? It's going to double. Will I be able to see the whole moon in the, in the field of view? No. Not no. anymore, right? It's too big. I can't see the whole thing. So I'm zooming in on just part of the moon. Does that make sense to you guys? So I'm changing, what am I changing right here? The magnification. Size of the focal right. length of the eyepiece. That's right. But, I, but by doing that, I'm changing the magnification. Okay. Now, I was hoping you guys would have an opportunity to see this little beautiful planet, my favorite. Mary and I went the other day, got up early. We got up at 4.30 and got out the telescope and looked at it. It was so fun. So, um, but anyways, maybe, maybe there'll be an opportunity. I don't know how, but maybe. I might actually get up early with a telescope and, and then videotape some of my stuff so you guys can see it too. Anyways, there's, there's Saturn, it's awesome. Here's a cluster, let's go back to this. We've got a star cluster. There's a star, oh, this is a pretty cool thing. It's called a globular cluster, right? And if I zoom in, right, 
I have to adjust the focus every time because it's a little bit off, right? And so I can start to see more detail, right? Now, we also, um, there's another little detail. We don't go into it too much in this lab, but it turns out that the size of the telescope really does matter, right? What does it do if it gets smaller? Does it collect more light or less light? Less. less. So what do you think will happen to my image? What do you think? Uh, it, hmm. Smaller. Smaller, okay, might get smaller. Okay, anything else? Or not as bright. Not as bright, exactly, not as bright. So you see what just happened? It's dimmer, right? I can switch back so you can see it. See how it's big, a little bit bigger. So that there's a magnification effect, but the main thing I want you to think about is uh, the dimming. See how dim it is? The smaller it is? Because we're losing light. We don't have, how much less light is in a four inch than an eight inch? Um, twice. Half. It's not twice. What is it? Half, right? Half as much? It's half one half. half, but remember what the formula is? Pi r squared. What's half of a half? A oh, fourth. It's a one fourth. fourth the light, right? It's one fourth the light. And so you're not going to see nearly as much detail. Okay. So that's a new thing. I've never played with that before. What, is that cool? I like that. But you yeah, need um, cool. flash. So I don't know if many people have flash anymore. So I think I will probably not be able to show them, but they saw a little bit. Okay. So here we go back to the slides. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about this, but there's, um, there's something called apparent and true field of view. The field of view is the angle of the sky that you can see, right? The angle of the sky. I actually could have showed you that on the other thing too, but the higher the magnification, the lower, the smaller the uh, field of view will be. I think you guys did an experiment on that. Okay, so filters, again, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but they're, they're pretty cool, little add-ons. We uh, didn't use them too much. We blocked a little bit of the moonlight, I think. That was one thing that we did. Uh, but filters can also be used to enhance colors. And what they do is when you see a red filter, what does it mean? Why is it red? What's going on? Does it let all the colors through? No. What colors get through a red filter? Red. 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 Very good. That's it. Now you might have actually um, learned somewhere in that the computers uh, use RGB, right? They use red, green, and blue as primary colors and mix them together. If you mix them together equally, you get white. So if I try to shine white light through a red filter, what do I get? Red. I just get red. red, right? So another way to think about red is it takes away the green and the blue. Did you hear me? Right? So when yeah. I say it, it lets through the red, it, the other way to think about it is that it takes away the green and the blue. So we call these subtractive uh, filters, right? They take away, they filter, they take away some of the light. And you can think about how the other ones work too. Um, but one of the, uh, the things that people do, the yellow here, maybe that's a cute one. Why would you do that one? Wow, actually, I'm not sure. Never mind. I don't know the answer to that question. I just realized I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer why yellow would be cool. Maybe Jupiter, maybe Jupiter. Uh, but usually the idea is that um, you're looking for, for certain colors. Like blue is used with Mars when you want to see the ice caps. It turns out it blocks, it makes the, the body of Mars look very dark. Why does it look so dark? What color is Mars? Red. It's red. Red. So red doesn't go through, right? But then the, the ice caps have blue because they're, they're actually white in color. And so we can see them. They pop. You can kind of see the ice caps. Oh, out. that's cool. And then we also have, you guys looked at the sun not too long ago. We have solar filters that block most of the light from, look, you know, so it's safe to look at. Okay. Uh, so there are two kinds of telescopes in this world. One is called the refractor which uses lenses and reflector, which is using a mirror to collect the light. But they both do the same thing, but in different ways. Okay, so we've actually seen some of this already, but I'm just gonna make sure you see it. The very simplest uh, refractor was built by Galileo. It looks something like this, right? Very, very simple. I've got way too many of the same things. Uh, so here's a refractor. We've got the objective and we've got the eyepiece, okay? And the light comes in and it comes out, okay? It's pretty simple, 
very basic principle, okay? The distance from the lens to this point is called the focal length. Focal point. Focal length. Yeah, that's the focal point. Focal so the length. distance is the yeah. focal length. And you notice that the focal lengths are not the same. Usually the objective has a much longer focal length, okay? And um, another picture. Um, so actually in the early days, these were the best telescopes. Um, and they tried to make them bigger and bigger. It turns out that the lenses, as they got bigger and bigger, got so heavy that they had to use heavier and heavier uh, metal to keep them, to, to hold them up, right? These casings right here, this body, this optical tube is what it's called, um, got to be so heavy that you needed an incredibly strong machine just to hold it up. So if you look at the old fashioned telescopes, uh, you know, from the from the 18 to 1900, early 1900s, these, there were enormous machines. Uh, nowadays, they're, they're still enormous, but they're very much lighter, much lighter weight. They're actually still pretty heavy, by the way, but, um, but for the size, they're incredibly big. They're not refractors anymore. They started to use reflecting telescopes. So the largest telescopes are all reflecting telescopes. But uh, astrophotography still uses them because the optics uh, can be very good and get wonderful pictures. Okay, so then Isaac Newton comes along, 1680, and remember the word chromatic, oh, I misspelled aberration, oops, it's double R, not double B, sorry about that, oops, good thing I have it here. So Isaac Newton invented the, um, the reflecting telescope, and, and what that did is it got rid of chromatic aberration. And he had, to, he had to figure out a pretty cool trick, he used a spherical mirror to focus the light, but it turns out that it would just focus it back the way it came. So he had to use a second mirror to get it to come out. Uh, and then later on, uh, Hadley uh, perfected and made a better design uh, that we actually use today. Uh, so what do they look like? Here's a, here's a couple of examples. Uh, so the original Newtonian right here, the light comes in the opening. What's the opening of the telescope called? the aperture, right? The aperture. And instead of going through a lens, it goes all the way to the back of the telescope where you see a mirror, the primary mirror. And the rays of light are trying to come together. They actually would come together maybe right out here. But what happens is you put a second mirror in the way and it bounces it out sideways. Here's where you're gonna put your eyepiece. You're gonna put your eyepiece out here. And so you can look through the side of the telescope at whatever it is you want to look at. So if you didn't do this, you would actually need to put your head up here and that would actually block the light from coming in in the first place. So not so great. Uh, there's a second one, uh, sorry, the next one, uh, let's look at this one, Coudé. Uh, again, I don't know why we have all this, but it's kind of cool. It bounces, it bounces and then comes out. And then this is actually the one that we use. This is called the Cassegrain. This is the telescope that we use. We have a special plate on the front, uh, which makes it a Schmidt Cassegrain. But anyways, the Cassegrain, it, it bounces, hits a secondary mirror and goes through an opening in the back of the primary mirror. Okay, it's called the visual back. We'll come back to that when I show you your telescope, the telescope that we use, okay? That's called the Cassegrain. So write down Cassegrain, just so you know what kind of telescope you were using. It's called the Schmidt Cassegrain. Okay, we'll talk about that more later. So I actually, you know what, I just realized I have another little thing I wanna show you, just very, very quick. But um, I have these cute little, what's going on? I don't know, uh, there we go, not that. Hold on, I got something, I got something for you. I have these cute little things. Um, these are very old school actually. In fact, you can't, you can't do them anymore either because they use, again, they use flash. Uh, but anyways, darn that flash. Okay, let's see if this works. Okay, so here is just a little, little story here. We can look at the light path. The yellow is the light path. We're dissolving the light and you can see the light coming in. It's focusing. Now you'll see there's an interesting thing. It never actually crosses over in this picture. And it turns out that is another way to do it. You don't actually need to, 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 to focus to a point. It can just try to focus to a point and then the second lens, the eyepiece lens is gonna intercept it and make it come together and form an image, okay? So what is the front lens called? Aperture. 
the well the opening no. is called the aperture the, no, the front no, lens yes. is called the objective no. lens the objective objective lens, objective lens. and then no. you have the eyepiece no. lens a little mini telescope here which is called the what's this called eyepiece the finder scope remember the finder scope okay and this is our optical tube right here okay and then i have another one hold on um this is a newtonian one second so here we go a newtonian this is a newtonian telescope right the light comes in the side here and bounces off of a mirror at the back of the telescope right and then comes in and bounces off a flat mirror here and this is this is kind of like a diagonal actually and here's your eyepiece that you're going to look through okay so it's called a newtonian telescope newtonian so what is the name for this mirror that catches the light in the first place the primary mirror the primary mirror okay the primary mirror okay so what's the light what the the mirror called that bounces the light secondary mirror the secondary mirror okay it's pretty simple okay and our last one is the Schmidt Cassegrain or Schmidt um, Schmidt telescope. And that one, hold on, here we go. So this is our telescope. So again, same idea, right? Except this time the light comes in the front and remember that little circle that we have on our telescope? That is actually the secondary mirror, right? That's the back side of the secondary mirror. So the light comes, uh, hits the primary mirror bounces to the secondary mirror and then bounces straight back through an opening in the primary mirror and then the light comes out what is this uh this piece right here that bounces the light 90 degrees you remember what that's called called the diagonal you remember that word diagonal okay and then the eyepiece is stuck into that and you got your little mini telescope right here called the finder scope finder scope the three legs are called the iPod? IPod. Know, these, these are pretty easy. These are pretty <laughs> easy questions, I know. But you know, I gotta make sure you know everything. You know all of this stuff. Okay. All right. So back to the slides then. I'm almost almost done. Let's see. A little bit more. All right. Hold on. Coming back. How you guys doing? Good. You okay? Good. Okay. Yeah. All right, so back to our story. It turns out that not all the light that we want to look at is visible light. Okay, so the telescopes we've been describing are really optical telescopes, right? Visual, I'm sorry, they're called visible light telescope. Uh, but as a matter of fact, nowadays, we look at light in all kinds of uh, uh, frequencies. And uh, you know what's higher frequency? What's higher frequency than, than visible light? You would say ultraviolet, x-ray gamma ray what's lower frequency than visible light infrared and radio this is also radio 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 this is all radio actually microwave should have been in here sorry microwave and then radio uh, this is an old school man it's really old school uh, so we have radio telescope x-ray telescope infrared telescopes um, gamma ray telescopes we have all of these uh, microwave telescopes, all of these, okay? Um, all right, but they are not necessarily the same. They don't look the same. And I actually have a few different telescope links here. Again, this is just for you if you're interested. I was supposed to visit this last week and I didn't get to go to Hawaii. I was gonna go to this. Uh, these telescopes. They're on the top of Mauna Kea um, and I didn't get to go. So next time, next time I'm gonna go. But these is a pair of twin telescopes. They're 10 meters in diameter do you guys understand that 10 meters they're enormous right enormous telescope uh, then we have down here the kit peak in arizona the very large telescope is actually a set of telescopes uh, in the atacama desert and look at this beast right this is a radio telescope a single telescope uh, which is built into a valley uh, called the arecibo telescope anybody heard of that one or some pretty yeah. famous movies there. Um, now, I actually didn't put, I feel like I feel like I should do it though. Let's just do something. I've never done this before. I, I ran out of time. Can you guys see my desktop? No, you can't, hold on. Uh, I, wanna, I wanna show you what I'm looking for. Um, so there is a large, the largest radio, can you see my Google? Yes. Okay, the largest radio telescope in the world is a Chinese telescope. 
and it is enormous. This is enormous. Wow. It is huge. It's even bigger than RC, but actually, how much is it? Actually, what are the 305? Okay, no, no, sorry. Hold on a second. It's cradled in the natural depression of 30s. Okay. It has more than twice the area of the largest radio dish, 305 meter. So, I, I don't know. So, it's not that much bigger, uh, it turns out, but it's, you know, double, twice the area. It's the largest radio telescope in the world. So, how do you move this thing? Anybody have an idea? Okay, that was a trick question. You don't. You don't. <laughs> you don't. So which, what do they look at? Whatever's straight above, right? Whatever happens to be right in front of them, that's what they look at. And so it's kind of like a timing thing. And, you know, they usually do a lot of surveys. Uh, and what that means is as the Earth is rotating, they will sweep a path across the stars. And they just look at whatever's there, right? Whatever happens to be in front of their eyes is what they're going to look at which I think is kind of fun too, you know, and they, and they've been very successful already. So pretty exciting uh, what they've been able to do. Okay. So back to our slide show and uh, yeah, so that's just a couple of telescopes So you can click. I have links for each one if you want to find out more information. And then uh, last thing I want to share with you is something called the very large array. And this is also radio telescope. It's an array in New Mexico. And um, actually, uh, you can't see it so well, but there's a whole bunch of telescopes. And the key thing is you should write down a, a, an array of telescopes are connected together electronically. Maybe you remember this. And they act like a single telescope. So because of that, they, um, you can make it pretty cheaply, actually, it turns out. You can make, um, let's see if I can show you some pictures. Um, radio telescope array, All right? So let's see some images. The goal is with a bunch of radio telescopes um, that they become effectively a much larger telescope. I wanna look, oh here, that's what I wanted to see. See how you have a, like these three lines of telescopes? They act like a giant circle as full of telescope, right? without having to have telescope in all these places. That's pretty cool, right? So what could be cooler than this? Well, I'm glad you asked. How about the largest effective telescope that has ever been built called the Event Horizon Telescope? And it used a network of telescopes around the globe, right? Look at this right here. Oh, look at that. That makes it effectively almost the size of the earth. You understand this? And what do they do with this fancy telescope, radio telescope? They took a picture of a black hole, right? And so you might've heard about that. The first picture of a black hole was taken with this radio telescope. And it's not, the black hole is actually inside here somewhere. What, what this is, is the light from the accretion disk, right? And it's brighter on one side and dimmer on the other. That's actually a blue shift and a red shift, it turns out. Uh, but anyways, kind of a, kind of a neat thing. Okay, so that is my telescope lecture. And so what I wanna do next is, uh, yeah, you learned a little bit about telescopes. I wanna uh, make sure you know something. I have to give you a telescope quiz next week. Um, and so there is a study guide already on Canvas. Actually, I can show you where that is. Um, actually, before I do, let me just make sure. Does anybody have questions? Uh, Urban, you are saying everything, okay. And, and a couple other people on there, that's great. Hi, people. Hello, everybody. Um, so let's see, we're going to go ahead and switch cameras. So we're going to need to, oh, I was going to show you, sorry, before I do that, let's go ahead and go back to, um, go back to here. If you go onto your files, you can find your study guides and you can find a telescope review. There's a little uh, work, a little review right here. Okay. Okay, so basic idea. Okay, now we're gonna go over this right now. So blah, blah, blah. Okay, so there's a review here. Um, but mainly um, what I just talked about on that slide set is what you're gonna need. Okay, so the next thing that I want you to do is grab your workbook 
and turn to the, I think it should just be the second page on in the workbook. It should say zero, zero B. Yeah, that's right inside. Yeah, perfect, that's it. And I'm gonna put it over here and I'm gonna fill it in with you, but hopefully we could do it, you know, together, like as we, as we look at it. So if you take a look at the first picture, or look at the picture, can you see what number one is? It's trying to show you this, this whole thing right here. Anybody want to guess what Isn't that might be? Ap aperture? There you go, aperture. What is the aperture? What is it? So you want to put down a definition. Now I can write words and you can copy my words, but it's much better if you try to write your own words. And so what, what is the, the goal of the aperture? It's to, what does it do? Select light. Well, it select doesn't light. actually, it doesn't quite collect it, but it lets in the light, right? Okay. It lets in the light that will be collected by, that was a good line, that will be collected by what? Um, what are the two, uh, two ways that, by the objective? Uh, by either the objective the lens. lens or the primary mirror. That's right. Yeah. That would be a good definition or yeah. the primary mirror. That's good. I like that. Okay. All right. Now, if you look at the picture again, we have a, uh, the two is like right next to the telescope. I actually think I probably could have done a better job of trying to explain what I'm talking about. But it's, it's trying to describe this part of the telescope, which happens to also be on this side as well. It's, it's what's holding the whole telescope together, actually. The tube. So, yes, that's right. It's called the optical tube. OK, so I probably could have mentioned that most of these words are on the page before, right? If not all of them, oh. they're actually on the page before. <laughs> But the idea is to see it in person, right? To actually see, see the, uh, the optical tube. So what is the job of the optical tube? What does it do? It holds it all together. together. It hold, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Just like we need to hold it all together. Yes. Okay. Hold it together, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold the telescope together. Okay, something like that. That's great. All right, let's see, number three. Can you see number three? Mm-hmm. What is number three? The, the primary mirror. I would go with that. I like uh, primary yeah. mirror. Yeah. And you'll notice where it's located. Where is it located? At the, the back. back. At the back of the optical tube. Very good, exactly. At the back of the optical tube. So uh, the furthest away from the aperture, okay? And so what is the job of the primary mirror? What do you do? Reflect the light. Yeah, let's say collect. Can we say that? You're right, it does reflect it, but we wanna to try to remember that the goal is to get as much light as you can, right? So collect the light and then what? And, and reflect, reflect it to a point, right? Reflect it, reflect yeah. it towards, towards, what's it called? A focal point. Focal point, there you go. Okay, reflect it towards a focal point, okay? But it doesn't actually get there because it hits number four, right? It's trying to get to a point, but it doesn't allow it to get to a point. What's number four? Secondary mirror. The secondary mirror, okay. So actually, um, I didn't mention this before, but why is the secondary mirror kind of a neat thing? What it does is it kind of folds the telescope, right? It makes it so the telescope doesn't have to be uh, as, as long as, you know, it doesn't have to get all the way to a point out here, right? We stopped it before it got to a point and made the light go back the way it came, right? So it kind of allows the telescope to be smaller, right? So what does it do though? It reflects the light from the primary mirror and then back through an opening in the primary mirror. Which we haven't gotten to yet, but we will. 
All right, number five. Can anybody find number five? And yeah. I like this diagram because five is so cool. What is five? Focus knob, right? That's the focus knob. Okay. But actually look carefully at the diagram. Do you notice what does this focus knob do? Do you have any idea? Is it doesn't it make the, the gap in the primary mirror bigger and smaller? Not exactly, but you, you see that it's connected to the primary mirror, right? Somehow yeah. it actually pushes the primary mirror forward or backwards. Uh -huh. It changes the position of the primary mirror, right? So what that means is it slides it forward or backwards. Think about the light trying to get to a point. Remember how your eye does the accommodation to focus That's the light on the stuff. retina? Yeah. It's kind of like yes, that. So this is like your eye muscles, right? That's kind of what oh. it's doing for you. Isn't That's that neat? so cool. Yeah. So what does it do? It moves. I mean, it, it, this is more than you need, I guess. It moves the primary mirror. But what it really does is in order to in order to focus the light, focus the image, right? In order to focus the image. Okay, how about number six? Now, actually, I think number six, I have to help you with. Um, number six is an opening in the back of the telescope. And it's actually the same place where the light is coming through uh, from the secondary mirror. So did you see the name? You want to look at the list of words and see if you can figure out which word it might be. Is it the eyepiece? Maybe it's no. not there. Oh, it's oh, there it is. Yeah, that's there. You see it? Oh, the visual back. That's what it's called. There you go. Write it down. Yeah. Visual. Can you guys read this? Oh, I need to move it up. Okay. There you go. Moving on up. Okay, here we go. Visual back. The visual back. What is the visual back? It's the opening in the back of the telescope. Where the light emerges, right? The light comes out. A light emerges. OK. How about number seven? See number seven? What What is number seven? What is it actually? Um, it's. Can you see what the light is doing when it hits number seven? Yeah, it's no, making no, it the 90. What is it doing? It's bending the light into like a 90 degree angle. It's yeah, so it's actually, it's not bending it then. Do you know what it's called when, it, when it's bouncing like that? It's reflecting it? Refracting. It's actually a mirror. Yeah, it's a mirror. Yeah, yeah. And, it's a diagonal. And, that's the diagonal, very good, the diagonal. And if you remember, you can actually manipulate the, you can change the position of the diagonal. But remember that if you're pointing the telescope up into the air, right? And if you're putting the telescope up into the air, then this would get kind of close to the, to the base of the tripod. And if you didn't have a, a diagonal, there wouldn't be enough room for you to put your head there, right? There's not enough yeah. space. So the, the diagonal kind of bounces the light out to make it possible to use the telescope, you know, when you're in different, different situations, right? So what does it do? So Daniel told us what it does. It bounces the light, how many degrees? 90. There you go. Bounces the light 90 degrees. 90 degrees, uh, just to make, it, to make it more convenient more convenient to use the telescope. That's really all it is. Okay. And our last one, number eight. What is number eight? That's the eyepiece, right? That's it, the eyepiece, very good. And now we have a special name. I mean, we really wanna make sure we understand what is the job of the eyepiece? What does it do? It takes the light that's come through the telescope and does what? It makes an image. It makes an image, right? It makes an image. And if we, uh, if we adjust the eyepiece, then what? If we change the eyepiece, what? It changes change, our position. Change the eyepiece, yeah. You, you change the focal uh, length, but what does that change? 
if you change the eyepiece, you change the change the. It's not. Is it the magnification? Yes, it is the magnification. You can see. This is too easy. <laughs> Okay, so we change our eyepiece, we change the magnification. The smaller the number on the eyepiece, what um, happens? The bigger the range you can see. That's right, the larger the magnification will be. Okay, thank you, Katja. Okay, so you guys, um, that's, that's my, my lectures and my worksheet. And so now I just wanna give you an activity. So this is a little funny. I don't, you know, we're, we're in a weird situation that I have, you know, like little fantasies where somehow we magically get to go back outside and look at the stars together. But, you know, I'm not really optimistic about that. I hope you guys are looking at the stars though. You know, yeah. go outside, look at the constellations and I, I will have to find a way to, to test you on your constellations again. But I want, to, uh, I, I want to let you know that we're really looking for some kind of activities. And I actually have a couple of ideas. So one of them would be using your um, your astrolabe. Let me let me look at you guys again so you can see my face instead of talking to a piece of paper. So um, one of the ideas I had would be to use your astrolabe, of course, to look at the stars. But what if I told you you could use it to measure the altitude of the sun? Can anybody figure out how you might do that? How would you use the astrolabe to measure the altitude of the sun? You wouldn't look at the sun, by the way, right? Don't look at the sun. But what could you do? It burns. Yeah, don't, you don't want to look, you don't want to use it the way we do with the stars. <laughs> that would be dangerous. Oh gosh. It, it burns. Yes, no, no, but but if you if you if you didn't use it like that, what if you looked at the astrolabe with the arrow sticking up and you pointed the astrolabe not looking at the sun at all? but looking at the astrolabe, just look at the astrolabe. And if you get the astrolabe pointed in the right direction, it'll make shadows, right? The little arrows will make shadows. Oh, and yeah. so I actually think I probably should just demonstrate this to you so that nobody makes a mistake and looks at the sun, right? <laughs> probably. I know, but anyways, uh, you could line the shadows up, right? Or line them up with, you know, the line the arrows up with each other and then your string, will be measuring the altitude of the sun. But it turns out it's not that hard and you know you could do this. And I actually, I'm, I'm trying to make a, a, a kind of exercise where you guys could do that during the day. And then what I would want you to do is to watch the altitude of the sun over a couple of hours. You wouldn't have to watch it all the time, just maybe you know, for you know, a couple of hours, every half an hour, take a reading and, and, or every 15 minutes or something like that and measure the angle of sun. Does that sound like, like something you would do just to try it out? Do you know what time? Do you know what time the sun reaches its highest altitude? Noon, right? At local noon, right? But what time is this now? What time would it be? Around what time? 12, right? No, or not 12. Around one. Why? Ooh. Why would it be one? Because what is the time right now? It oh, because we we we... We, we did, did the whole change. clock thing, right? We did daylight savings. We pushed the clock oh, right. forward. We sprung right. forward. So, what's that? Oh, we, we sprung forward. Yes, we sprung forward. So you could see that the sun is really reaching its apex, its highest point at about one o'clock, which would have been 12, you know, in the, in the standard time. So that's what I'm thinking about. But right now, I want to give you an activity to do uh, without using the sun and without using your... Uh, your astrolabe, but also getting used to using this tool. Uh, so I wanna use the Stellarium and I wanna have you um, make a picture. Um, actually, what I want you to do is I want you to make a picture of where Venus is gonna be over the next month, okay? And so what I want you to do is make a track on one of these pages, which one? Uh, it's, gotta be, it's gotta be this one. Can you the one. one in the back? Yeah, no, 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 I'm going to do it right here, actually. I'm going to ask you to go look at page 22. These are the constellations that, that uh, Venus is going to be in. And I want you to make a series of dots where Venus is, and I want you to put the dates right next to them, okay? 
so that you can see okay. a track and then you'll upload a picture of that when you're finished. So this is your, it's a very easy activity, I promise you, because I'm going to show you exactly what to do. Okay. Uh, if you want to go a little, page? are you confused? Oh, no, uh, uh, what was the page number? Oh, the page I'm using is 22A, oh, okay. 22A, 22A. So if you use 22A, this, these constellations are the ones that, that are actually relevant. And so let's go ahead and switch over to Stellarium Web. Uh, but actually, if you downloaded Stellarium, that's really what I wanted you to be using. Uh, so, you know, you could use Stellarium or Stellarium Web in this case. Uh, the thing I want to do, let's go back. What's the date? Oh, it's, it's right. The date is right. Okay. So can anybody see Venus? Okay. I don't see Venus. Where is Venus? Oh, there it is. Okay. Venus. Now you can do some things right here. If you want to, if the ground is a little bit distracting, you can turn it off. Oh. If you, if you want to do this during the daytime too, you could actually do it night or day, you could turn off the atmosphere. All right, you can turn off the landscape. I, th I think maybe leave the landscape on for now, whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay, so you can see today, where is Venus? Well, actually, look at this. Venus is right next to the Pleiades cluster, right? Isn't that cool? So if you can, go look at Venus tonight. It'll be right next to, it almost looks like it's a part of it. Is that crazy? I oh, love yeah. it. This is so neat. Okay, um, the Pleiades cluster. And then what you're gonna do is actually just advance time. So make a little dot if you can. Uh, if you're a little bit confused, you wanna turn your paper. So let's switch back actually, hold on. Let's, uh, let's stop for a second. If you turn your paper, this is more like the way it looked, right? Like this, remember that this was, uh, it was right about here, okay? And Taurus was over here. Let's look one more time and see if you can see what I'm talking about. Make it match. Oh, you see it? Yeah. Okay. So now we can just go in advance time one day. Ooh, look at that. Now it's right on top. Actually tomorrow night, it's gonna be right in the middle of the Pleiades cluster. Tonight, it's pretty good. But tomorrow night is even better. So tell your friends, let's go look at Venus. It's going to be right inside of the Pleiades cluster. No way. Check it out. It's going to be magnitude negative 4.31. Anyways. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Your friends get into this. All right. And then we, uh, we can advance time. Advance time. Look at this. Uh-oh. Where are you going, Pleiades? Okay. Oh, look at this. What the heck? They got a little satellite this thing shows satellites this is cool it's crazy crazy okay stick on venus okay um if you wanted to you could measure the altitude but no don't worry about it um i just wanted you to draw the track actually no tonight you're just going to do just just show me the track okay so show me as long as you can how venus is progressing which way is it going okay you guys understand what I'm asking you to do? Yeah. So do so uh, do you want us to do like it every day, or you do you don't want have to do next? Maybe maybe every week is enough. Except yeah, that's I, what I, I was want thinking. you to catch. I want you to catch when it changes. So I said a month, right? A month. A oh, month is really. Where did it go? Oh, it was in the other direction. Oh, no, it's fading away. Okay, I need to turn this off. Okay. So which constellation is it in right now? Origa. Origa. Not yet. It's still in Taurus. Uh, oh, okay. It's almost in Origa, right? Almost in Origa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I fooled you. Okay. And then a little bit further. Why don't you go more than a Oh, Oh, look, who's coming to visit? Mercury. Oh my gosh, look at that. Is that awesome? Oh. May 21st, right next to each other. What's the altitude? Okay, they're pretty, pretty low though. Oh man. What the heck? How could that be? Oh, because you know what? Never mind. Look, they're underground. 
Oh, I know. I was getting all excited. Uh, yeah, that would have been so cool. Southern Hemisphere, they could see it, but not us. Okay. Yeah, anyways. Okay, so yeah, you know what? Actually, just do it for a month, and it's fine. So look at the track. Actually, that'd be kind of fun. It's kind of neat to see that. Mm. So if you keep going, though, it's kind of fun to see what happens with Venus. If you notice, it's not, oh, what the heck? Did you, did you see something happen? Look what's happening to Venus. It's now going in the other direction. What do we call that? Retrograde. 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 Finally, retrograde. Retrograde. Yeah. That's right. So then watch out, boy. When Venus is retrograde, your love life is in tatters. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Actually, at some point, I'm going to tell you guys about some astrology. I got some stuff on astrology, too. Anybody the into pseudoscience. <laughs> Mainly just for fun. Just for fun. All right. Well, so let's see. We covered we covered telescopes. We covered um, the stuff on the workbook. We covered a little exercise you can do right now, which is to track Venus. And you can use that software, by the way. It's actually pretty cool software. Daylight savings is correct. Uh, image retracted. What happened? What the heck? I don't know how to do that. Um, but anyways, um, so I think... I think that's about all I have for you tonight. Does anybody have questions or you have things that you're concerned about or anything you want to talk about? Um, so we have a quiz to do on the 7th. What's Hello? on the 7th? This is a quiz due on we the 7th. We have a quiz. Oh, um, which quiz is it? Hold um, on. It was on Canvas. Oh, yeah. Did you take that? Oh, I forgot no. to tell you about that. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk yeah. about that. Okay. Um, so, yeah, the coordinate system quiz. That's what you want to. Yeah, you got to take that. Okay. So, I, I'm giving you a little bit of time. I, I think I sent you an email about it. Yeah. But the no. idea is here's a coordinate system. Okay. So, actually, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is, yeah, why don't we, uh, if, if you didn't take it yet, who, who hasn't taken it? Anybody here? I haven't okay. taken it. You haven't taken it. Okay. So let's show you what you should be doing then. Uh, there's a study guide right here. Take a look at that. Uh, yeah. And then if you want to practice um, the terrestrial coordinates, click on Google Earth, which is pretty awesome. It runs right in the browser. And, and the idea is, um, I'm going to be showing you a picture. Actually, I, I, I took it right from Google Earth, right? It's, it's just looks something like this. It's something just like this. And I said, what is this location right here? Right? Something like that. What is this called? What is the location? Except the letters N and E and W and S are missing, right? So you have to know that if you go this direction, this is uh, the equator, and here is the prime meridian. Right. If you go this direction, you're going west. If you go this direction, you're going east. If you go this direction, you're going north. And if you go this direction, you're going south. Right. So if I looked at a point like right around here, you can actually just click, I think, or hover. No, it doesn't. It's not showing me. Uh, oh, I have to do. I have to put a point. I have to go like this. And then I can select the point. And it actually oh, it doesn't show me the location. Huh. I thought it did. If I just hover, maybe? Hold on. I hover. Oh, it's down in the corner. Can you see it in the lower right hand corner? It actually shows you the location. So 38 degrees, 38 degrees east longitude, and 18 degrees north latitude. Can you see that, Daniel? Yeah. So you, I, I, you, don't, you don't get the numbers on the quiz, but you're going to get a point somewhere. You know, there's a point like right here. What would the coordinates be? Don't look in the corner, right? Just try to figure it out. Well, it's going to be... Start with the east-west longitude. 20 it's... east by 15 or 13 north. 
Yeah, it's pretty close to the middle. So I'd say 15. Okay, is pretty so good. Yeah, 15. Like but right. it's multiple choice, so you, you're not going to get it wrong. It's not that hard, okay? Oh. So there's going to be a question on the earth. Okay, so, but there's other things. Maybe we should just talk about the, the things you're supposed to know. Uh, what do we call the two primary poles in the terrestrial system? The two mm. primary no. poles. North, North pole and south. south pole. Okay. South pole. What, what do we call the primary great circle? The equator. The equator. Very good. What do we call the secondary great circles which wrap from pole to pole? Meridian lines. The meridian, meridian lines. That's why the special one is called the prime meridian. Lines. You can remember that, right? Yeah. What do you call the secondary small circles which are parallel to the primary great circle? And parallels of latitude. Parallels of latitude, right? As parallels they go up towards the pole. Right. What okay. is the, where do you find the um, reference point? Where's the reference point? It's where the prime meridian crosses the equator. Right there. And what's the name that we give it in our lab? It's a zonk. 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 We call it zonk. That's zonk right there. Um, what is the, the coordinate called parallel to the primary grade circle? What is it called? Parallel. Uh, Along the equator. Longitude. Longitude. What is the yeah, coordinate okay. called perpendicular to the primary grade? Latitude. 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 Okay. All right. So that's that's uh that is the terrestrial system. Okay. And then All if right. you want to practice, um, going back right here. Oh, I have to go way back. Oh, never mind. Close it up. <laughs> too many. I got too many. I click on Stellarium Web, and then I'll show you the trick. You can close this little side thing. You don't need it. Um, and you want to practice, right? So you can zoom out a little bit. But you see down here, there's azimuthal grid, bam, just like that. And you can practice. Now you can you can actually zoom in if you want. The problem is that the numbers are a little bit faint. Can you guys see the numbers up here? Yeah. So this is 345. Oh, let me, let me point south. That's better. Okay, so or like over here. Let's go over here. There's some star, there's Arcturus, right? So let's look at Arcturus right there. You see Arcturus, okay? And you see 75, and is it just a little bit past 75? What do you think? What would be a good number here? So- 76, 77 maybe. I'd, I'd say 76 is probably fine, 76. And then on the vertical, you're going up, this is 20 degrees. And this is zero. This is the horizon line. So what would be the number? What would you guess? It's maybe 15? Yeah, probably not. If you go halfway, it's 10, right? And here's halfway. I'm putting my, my oh, tip right. in right there. So what do you think? Maybe like 12. 12. 12 or 13. Yeah, so let's click it. And it'll tell us the numbers right here. And the numbers are 75 degrees and 39 minutes, which I would round up to 76 minute degrees and then 13 degrees for the altitude, okay? So azimuth and altitude are the two numbers that you're trying to get. So we zoom back out, you can zoom. And by the way, what happens if you wait a little while? Will the numbers change? Yeah, they change, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Numbers change, right? So this is, this is a, the system doesn't keep the same numbers, right? So a little while later, you see this is the same star, Arcturus, uh, but as you can see, it's between 75 and 90. What would be the estimate right here? There's the middle. What do you think? 75 and 90. 75 and 90. What do you think? Um, 82? 80, 80, 80, 80, 83. I might go 83 or maybe even 84. 83, 84, something like that. And how about on the vertical? Here's 20 and here's 40. Yeah, it's uh, 20. 24, 23. Okay, good, let's see, take a look. And you guys are pretty close, 83, right? And 25, yeah. you'd be able to guess because it's a multiple choice test, okay? okay so nice. you just pick the number that's closest, right? You, you, they're not gonna be, I'm not gonna give you like 25.2 and 25.3, right? They're gonna be pretty easy mm -hmm. for you to distinguish. And there's so, the horizontal, right? So this is called the horizontal system. Let's go through the, uh, the whole thing, right? What do you call the two primary poles? One right above your head, the other below your feet. North the zenith. South pole. No, the zenith, zenith and the nadir, right? Zenith, yeah, zenith and nadir oh, point, right? right? The okay. zenith, 
and nadir. This is called the uh, horizontal system, right? Nadir. Zenith oh. is right above our head. And nadir is down here below our feet. Okay. What do you call the primary great circle? Celestial horizon. That's right. The horizon. It exactly cuts horizon. the sphere of stars in half. All right. There's a top half that we see and a bottom half that we don't see, right? The celestial horizon. What do you call the secondary great circles which go from pole to pole? It's the vertical circles. That's right, they're vertical circles. In the horizontal system, the vertical lines here are vertical circles. That's an easy thing to remember, right? Horizontal yeah. system, vertical circles, okay. What do you call the secondary circles, secondary small circles, which are parallel to the primary and get smaller as you go towards the pole. Parallels of altitude. Parallel, parallels of altitude, because you're measuring altitude right. as you go up. What do you call the coordinate measured along or parallel to the primary great circle? The north cardinal point. No, what do you call, oh, I, I, skipped, I skipped something. What do you call oh. the coordinate along the primary great circle? Oh, the, the azimuth. Azimuth. And what do you call the coordinate perpendicular? Altitude. Right. Now, what do we call the, uh, the reference point? Where is it? There we Where's go. zero comma zero? That was the north cardinal point. Right, right. Here, right. So right on the horizon, right on the horizon at where north is, right underneath Polaris. Okay. Well, not quite. Right underneath the north celestial pole. Actually, I don't know if I can turn on celestial poles. Uh, I can't. Oh, I can turn on this. I can turn on that. That's the local meridian line, right? Okay. Um, I got distracted. What am I doing? Oh, yes. What do we call the coordinate measured perpendicular to the primary grade circle? Altitude? Oh. That's right. That's the altitude. Okay. This is all on the study guide. It's all stuff that you should practice. Okay. Take away this and now switch to the equatorial grid. This is our coolest equatorial grid. Um, should we start with the names? Let's do the names first, okay? What do you call the two primary poles? The NCP and the SCP. Very good, NCP, SCP. What do you call the primary great circle? The CEQ. That's right, the celestial yeah, equator, celestial which goes equator. out of the E and goes into the W like this, right? It's exactly half of the sky. Ooh, that looks Whoa. weird. I know, it's kind of weird, sorry. Okay, what do you call the secondary great circles, which go from one side to another? Okay, I don't have any numbers, so I need to zoom in a little bit. If you zoom in, the numbers start showing up. And you see here 13H, 12H, 11H, 10H. And if I the zoom- hour in, circles? That's right, they're called the hour circles. What's the biggest hour that you can get to? 20. 24. 24 hours, right? It goes from zero, zero hours. This one will be 23. I can't see a 20, there we go, 23, which means it goes back to being 24, right? So 24 hours in a day, okay? Those are the hour circles. What do you call, I'm getting confused here. What do you call the secondary small circles which get smaller as you go towards the pole and are parallel to the primary grade circle? Declination? Parallels of declination, right? Okay, so that's declination. Okay, so these lines right here are parts of circles. They're called parallels of declination. Okay, so um, there's Arcturus, uh, Spica. Let's use Spica. Okay, so I, I'm looking at Spica and I wanna use the lines. First of all, I wanna do the, I wanna do the right ascension. Oh, I forgot, to, I forgot to ask you a question. What do you call the coordinate measured parallel to the primary grade circle? Right ascension. Right ascension. What do you call the coordinate measured perpendicular to the primary grade circle? Declination. Declination. Okay, so here's Spica, right? We've got Spica. And I see here 13H, 13 hours, and I see here 14H. Give me an estimate for thir between 13 and 14. What do you think? 24 minutes? Sure, 24, something like that, right? Here's 30 yeah, three hours, 13 hours, 24 minutes. 13 hours and 24 minutes, okay. And then uh, on the vertical, what do you notice right here? You see it's on the, there's the negative, this is zero, negative 10, negative 20. What do you think? Mm, maybe negative nine? It's, this is negative 10, 
and negative 20. 20. Oh, we're going down. Seven. So 11. Negative 11. 11 or 12. Negative. Yeah, negative 11 or negative 12, something like that. Okay, I'd go with negative 12, I think, right? And here we go. And it says, ah, oh, negative 11 was better, actually. Oh. So 13 hours, yeah. 26 minutes. You said 24, right? But 26 yeah. is close enough. And then negative 11 minutes and 15, 11 uh, hours, uh, 11 de and degrees and 15 minutes. Okay. That's confusing. Okay. These <laughs> minutes and these minutes are different. Okay. And they're really different. All right. Um, okay. So the declination of spica is negative. What about Arcturus? Arcturus, is it positive or negative? And by the way, for the rest of your life, that's the coordinates for spica. What you just, what you just heard, right? For the rest of your life, you know the coordinates really? of spica. 13 hours, 26 minutes, 16 seconds, negative 11 degrees, 15, almost 16 minutes of declination. Okay. What about Arcturus? What do you think? Between 14 and 15, I'm going to go halfway just to give me an, an idea. What do you think? Almost half of half. So, like, 15, how many minutes 15? is it half of a half of an hour? Like 15? 15. Okay. So, what would you say? hours 15, 15 minutes 14 hours and 15 minutes of right ascension and then now we're going zero positive 10 positive 20 what do you think 19 positive 19 let's try it oh boom right what'd you guys say 14 hours 16 minutes actually almost 17 but that's close enough and then positive 19, okay? You guys are good enough right now to do this, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the other part of the quiz is, so you have to identify three points, one in terrestrial. What's the name of the system, by the way? This one's equatorial. The equatorial system. I did forget to ask you a question. Where, what is the name for the reference point? The vernal equinox. That's right, it's called the vernal equinox. So if I go back in time, I didn't have to go back that far to 320, I think it was, right? 319, 320, and I go back and find the sun. Where is the, where is the sun? It should be like right on it or very close to be, it. Yeah, it should be really close, okay. And there is the sun and you can see it's not perfect. So I can actually see, so is it a positive or negative declination? Negative. So is it there yet or not yet? Not quite. Not quite. So a couple minutes later, maybe an hour, a couple hours. What is it? Oh, Whoa. I think I think what happened is um, I'm not on the sun anymore. <laughs> I think that's what happens. Uh, what does it say? Oh, you it's know why? Not. It's not letting me. Now I can see it. Oh, now I can see it. Oh, you see? Let's see, a couple hours later. Oh, you see it's zero degrees, 10 oh, minutes. Yeah. So I'm getting really close. Oh. 10 minutes, okay. Zero degrees in 10 minutes. I don't know, it's not changing. Something's not right. I don't know. This, no, this web app is not perfect. I, I think that, that you guys will have much a better time in the app. Use the app. Use the app. Okay. I mean, don't, yeah, don't use, this web thing is imperfect. So, I yeah. mean, it's pretty good, but it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. Okay, so the 20th was about the Equinox, that's right. All right, well, I so think- I just, I'm, get the, I, I just get the Stellarium app. Yeah, you can get it on your phone or in any computer yeah. that you have. So okay. if it, it runs on a Mac, a PC, anything. But if cool. you can't get it to run, um, then use the web. It'll work. It's just not as okay. good. Yeah, I mean, if you just want to do the work on Venus uh, with the web one, it works fine. But when you want to do anything more involved, I think that the, the apps are better, work better for you. All right, so that's it for tonight, guys. Thank you so much. Great to see you. Awesome. And then uh, look cool. for, Thanks, you're welcome. And look for tomorrow uh, or tonight or tomorrow, look for a little quiz for participation. And then I'm gonna ask you guys to upload your picture of Venus, the track that you made for Venus. So we'll figure out a way to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll find a place for you to put that up. Okay. All right.
Cool. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a good All evening. Right. Be well. Be well. Thank Stay you. safe, okay? Will do. All right. All you right. too. Thank you. Goodbye, Urban. You got it. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> I think